picked up. Okay, so we're going to start. Hello, everyone. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. Welcome to Thursday Talk Shop series. So this series will run during this school holidays and is organized by the LKC NHM's Outreach and Education Unit, which is my team and myself. My name is Ja. I manage the education unit at the museum. And today, my colleague, Cherry, and I will be hosting a session. Cherry, please wait. Ah, yes. Hello. <laughs> So these talk shops are aimed to be casual, educational and suitable for all ages and it will be 45 minutes long and we'll be chatting with our guests on a particular topic. So we've actually called this talk shop right because we're going to be talking about work with people we work after work. But technically, technically since all of us are working from home right so we are by right at work but I guess you all get the idea. So we won't only be talking to museum colleagues but it could also be people we work with on collaborative projects. So for the first half an hour, we're going to be chatting with the guests and we'll open up to questions for the last 15 minutes. If you're worried that you will forget your questions during the talk itself, please feel free to write it down in the chat box. We will collate it and try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A segment. You can ask us anything about the topic discussed or to the speaker or to us hosts about what we do uh, uh, as part of our work. So I'll give a very quick introduction to the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. For those of you who may not have visited us before, or maybe you've already missed us because since we're temporarily closed now, right? Okay, so the museum is located at the National University of Singapore, NUS campus. We have a very wonderful gallery, as you can see from the slides over here. Um, Chai, can you move on to the next slide? There's something on the slides. Can you see the slides? Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. So as you can see over here, this is how our gallery looks like. Uh, we have a very wonderful gallery with real dinosaur fossils, a real skeleton and crocodiles and so on and so forth. The Outreach and Education Unit, which is what I'm part of, we conduct outreach and education programs both indoors and outdoors, such as gallery tours, education workshops, talks, nature walks, camps and many things, uh, and many more. So the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum, we have a very strong research interest and goals, particularly on Southeast Asian biodiversity. So today we've got a museum colleague from the research site and he also is a good friend. So we're going to be talking to Fu Mao Sheng. Mao Sheng, please wait. <laughs> yes, so I'll let him explain himself about what he does at the museum and he works with insects too and actually loves them. So I'm using the word actually because not all of us like creepy crawlies, right? But he's one of those people who actually loves them a lot. So we'll just start uh, and Cherry will take over now. Hey, hi Mao Shen. Hi. So what do you do at the museum? Okay, so uh, okay. just a quick introduction about myself. I, I'm a curator of the uh, cryogenic collection. So for the cryogenic collection, that is where we keep the super cool stuff. Uh, literally the super cool stuff. So that is where we store our uh, frozen samples of DNA and tissues and blood, right? Uh, but on the other hand, I'm also curating the entomological collection. So basically all your different kinds of insects, right? Uh, among the entomologists, right, each of us has our own area of interest or you could say our own specialty. So just for the record, right, my area of interest is actually lies in Blattonia. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with what's Blattonia, it's a group of insects that consists of your cockroaches and your termites. So uh, I'm giving a bit of a warning here. Right, there will be some cockroach image that's going to come up. So if you are, have a phobia of it, right, you maybe you want to take a few steps back from your screen because they will be popping up uh, sooner or later. Okay. Yep. So that's a quick introduction about myself. All right. So before you go into the topic of inset, we would like everyone to share what you think about inset. So we are going to have this interactive um, work club poll here. So you can use your phone to scan the QR code on the screen or go to the website pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode inset with an S, so insets. And once you enter this uh, web page, click on enter this discussion and type in your one word answer to what comes to your mind when you think about insects. So this is to allow us to gauge your perception of insects. Okay, so once again, you can use your phone and scan the QR codes as seen on the screen or go to the link pigeonhole.at or you can simply click onto, uh, onto the link that uh, my one of my teammates have um, pasted on in the chat box. 
Okay, so you can see very interesting response already. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to continue this um, um, this chat while the viewers contribute to this club, uh, work club poll. In case anyone missed the QR code, this is the QR code once again, and the link is pigeonhole.at. Okay, so we will go back to and review the work clouds later. Okay, so motion, what are insects and how diverse and abundant insects are? Ah, so what are insects? Now, usually, uh, usually uh, people will know their insects are consist of three body parts, like your head, your thorax, your abdomen, uh, they have six legs, right, uh, buggy eyes. But when then there are uh, like for the layman, they will say you no know, bugs, right? But your bugs not just include the insects, it includes your other different creepy qualities like your spiders, scorpions, uh, centipedes, right? Um, when it comes to insects, there's a whole spectrum also, like you can see from the image right now. Uh, there's from the charismatic ones like your butterflies, dragonflies, your honeybees, down all to the way that they are like nasty, they are, they are a pest, right? So there is whole lot of diversity of insects. But I think sometimes what people may not know is that even though they are very small, they are actually the most abundant animals on earth, right? Uh, to date, we have at least 1 million species uh, recorded and still counting, right? So the diversity is actually really, really huge. Um, that uh, I guess you no know, Ja and Cherry, you all have done some of uh, insect sorting, so you would know how tedious it is to sort the insects, right? If you want to sort them down to species, you can take up to a, even to a month to sort them out. Now, we as you from the picture that you see that we have actually a whole lot of different insects, right? Uh, make a guess which one of them is actually the most diverse or the most abundant insect on earth, right? Usually, people would say, "Oh, it's the beetles," right? Because uh, there's a in the past, different naturalists has collected lots and lots of different species of beetles, right? So, to to date, we have at least three hundred and eighty thousand species of beetles are uh, on record. But in the recent years, uh, beetles are actually now not the most abundant or the most diverse uh, species we really. Cherry, maybe you want to make a guess uh, to which group of insects is actually the most diverse? Could be ants or wasps? Yes, you're right. right. Wasps is actually the most diverse group. Uh, why is that so? We are actually looking into the parasitic wasps or the parasitoids. Right? Then usually they are always uh, very specific in their host. So you just imagine that each of the 380,000 species of beetle each of them holds one species of wasps, right? That is already 380,000 different wasps. But you can apply it to the other groups also, like to your um, caterpillars, to your grasshoppers, to your flies. The number of wasps is actually very, very huge. So that shows you how diverse and how abundant insects are really on Earth. Yep, so that's about insects. <laughs> Indeed, insects are the most diverse group with more than 1.4 million species recorded. So that's a lot. Okay, so let's go back and see the word clouds here. And wow, you can see um, there's a lot of impressive um, response that we have oh, gathered so far. Oh, and the most okay. prominent one that we get is diversity, cool, creepy, uh, creepy mm -hmm. and entropoda. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see a mixture of good and bads as mm. well. Like I can see one that says everywhere. Indeed, <laughs> insects they are everywhere. Mm. They are awesome. <laughs> some of them, some of you also put they are cute. They are misunderstood. That's right. So that's what we are here for. And the negative one, you can say that they are crazy. They are yucky. Mm, and yes. yep. So you can see a lot of response like e and scream about <laughs> insects as well. So you can see a mix of good and bad. <laughs> Okay, so I, thanks to everyone who has contributed to this work poll. Yeah, I'm not surprised by the words that has given. <laughs> we have a whole lot of it. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that you know some people find it cool, some people find it creepy. So that shows the spectrum of like uh, the reactions to insects. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Mao, you know, many years of working together, right? And we've been friends for quite a while. I know you love insects, but I don't actually think I've asked you why. So why do you like insects so much? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. From my perspective, like, according to some of the words there, I would say, you know, insects are not just awesome creatures. Uh, they are very cool ones also. Um, one of the things that I really like about insects is that they are very diverse, right? They have different kinds of shapes, different kinds of colors. 
it's so much more that uh, every time you see a new insect, it's, like, it's quite a new discovery. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'm also interested to see that transformation, right? From an insect that's plain or even ugly looking, to becoming something very beautiful like your butterflies, uh, to something very cool like your, uh, maybe let's say, your praying mantis, right? So, I know the words can be quite subjective. Uh, but along the way, you know, as I learn about insects, I do see some very fascinating ones and some uh, weird ones. So maybe I'll just share some of you of the, my encounters before. Uh, the first one that I have encountered uh, when I was very young was the backworm moth. Right, so uh, the backworm moth right, is uh, under the group for your butterflies and moth. So we generally know that caterpillars, uh, once they reach adulthood, they will change into moths. Like the flying ones. But the unique thing or what interests me is that for the backbone moths, only the males will turn into moths. The females do not. Right? This is a process what we call as neutering. So basically that the insect becomes an adult but retains its larva form. So the female backbone moth, right, they have no eyes, no legs, no wings, you know, but they can still secret pheromone to attract the males. So they are literally just a bag of eggs. Yeah, so that is actually quite interesting, you know. And this process, we can also see in our child bite beaters, where the females uh, retain their larval form, so they look a bit like caterpillars. Yeah, but, you know, talking about neoteny, you know, having to be an adult, but retain your youthful looks, I think that one is just quite familiar uh, among us humans also, right? I think our audience might agree too. <laughs> Uh, with to make yourself beautiful. Uh, so that's one thing. The other one that we also can tend to know of, but right, basically out near our food, is the Jopsophila flies, right? or what we call them as the common food flies. Right? They come to our like, bananas, they come to our apples. Right? So they tend to be small, uh, and we know that uh, their the larvae or their maggots, right? they actually feed off bacteria from the decaying organic matter. So these Drosophila flies, right, they are under this group called Drosophilidae. So most of the maggots, they will feed off uh, organic material uh, for the bacteria itself. But there's one specific group called Eclitoxenus. The maggots itself, they are actually predators. So as you can see from your bottom right hand corner of the screen, right, they look at your, like any other maggots of the Drosophila flies, but they actually would find uh, white flies and then feast on them. So basically, these maggots or these flies are actually your friends. Right? And where you see white flies are basically on like your chili plants and your tomato plants. So if you like, you know, encounter any maggot on these plants, right, uh, just you know, hold back. They are actually your friends. They're helping you to clear off any white flies that are actually on your plant. So that is actually one interesting thing to know for me uh, with regards to maggots, that not all of them are bad. Some of them are actually uh, friends to us. <laughs> The next one, uh, the next one is uh, under my area of interest. So basically, we are looking at termites. So when you actually mention the word termites, right, people always have the general idea that termites are pets because they destroy your furniture, they destroy your doors, right? And in some cases, like in China, they actually destroy their money because the money is made of paper. But your what is so cool about them is that you know for your termite workers, as you can see from the left hand side of the picture. They are actually all blind, but they can actually tell how much wood is actually available at the foraging site. But they don't exactly like know measure how many steps there are to measure uh, how much wood, you know, whether it's a big wood or a small wood. They actually use vibration signal to tell how much wood there is. So basically, they can hear how much wood. Right? That same kind of uh, ability right, is actually how it helps to defend the colony. So for example, in Singapore, we have our pangolins, right? And one of their favorite food is your termites. So the moment they start you know, trying to dig into the termite nest, right, it sends a vibration signal and the soldiers will send out an alarm signal to the rest of the colony. Within seconds, the termites can actually you know, gather at the breaching site, all the major soldiers. Then the workers will actually retreat back together with the young. So all within seconds, yeah. just before the pangolin actually breaches into the termite nest, they are actually ready to defend it. So that's how fast, yeah. because sound travels very fast in the solid matter. Now, uh, the last one. This actually happens quite recently also. Uh, it's basically we're talking about bee flies. Right? So uh, on the Facebook group, someone was sharing a picture of a bee fly, as you can see right now. So, uh, people were commenting like, oh, your bee fly is very cute, you know, it's very fluff, uh, fluffy. You know, some people say, oh, I want to cuddle it. So everyone's like totally adoring it. 
And some of the commenters, they who are Pokemon fans, they will also bring out the picture of Cutie Fly, right? The bottom right hand corner. Right. So uh, Cutie Fly is actually an uh, inspiration from your V Fly itself. So you can see there's a lot of similarities. So while everyone is all adoring how cute the uh, B Fly is, right? Well, I just had to interject in and tell them saying that does anyone know uh, your B Fly has a very dark childhood? Then of course some of them were like commenting, what do you mean by a dark childhood? So I have to tell them, your larvae of your bee flies are actually baby eaters. Right? Uh, don't have to worry, they not really say go after human babies. They will actually go for the babies of other insects. So what happens is that an egg will be laid inside an egg case itself, and then the larvae will hatch and start eating the eggs. But most of the time, the eggs are actually fertilized. So when you have a fertilized egg, you know what's inside. You have an embryo. Mm. So the larvae will actually not just eat the eggs, they will also eat the embryo too. So that's why they earn the name baby eaters. I guess uh, with mm. the fact itself, bee flies are not as cute as you think they are. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Are so looks are... These things I find about your mm. Yeah, so clearly looks are deceiving. <laughs> <laughs> so when I do um, gallery tours and workshops at a gallery, mm. I tend to get people squirming is usually the insect zone. So as shown in the slide, so that's actually two panels that you can see in the gallery of the museum. So why is this so mal? Um, like why are insects so disgusting to some people, and why do some people like them? Uh, well, oh. I actually do. I do see a few people who are like say they are find them very gross. They find very creepy, and to the further end of the spectrum, they are actually very fearful. Right. Uh, maybe not fearful of all insects, but they are fearful of a particular group. That's my area of interest, you know? basically your cockroaches, right? Uh, cockroaches are actually the top most fear of insects uh, among the groups. Uh, but just to digress a little bit, right? Uh, I want to bring in about a film called After Earth, right? featuring uh, Will Smith and Jaden Smith. Basically, in that, there's one particular scene. The father was actually giving some wisdom to his uh, son saying that you know you have to know that uh, you must realize you no know, fear is not real right uh, fear is actually a product of the thoughts that you have created right but do not misunderstand right danger is very real while fear may not be real so fear is actually a choice so why do people find them creepy or why are they even scared of like uh, insect especially your cockroach right i would say that fear of cockroaches is actually learned from young. How is that so? Right, to give you an example, right, when you are young itself as a baby, you tend to mimic not only just the uh, emotion of the, someone who is senior or someone who is experienced, you also mimic the reaction. So like for example, say uh, an adult you know, seizes a cockroach and starts uh, running away and screaming, the child will actually try to mimic their own reaction. But also compound with the fact that knowing that some of these cockroaches, like your American cockroach, they are dirty, they are vectors of diseases, right? It adds on and then over the years, it amplifies and becomes a fear. Yeah, mm. so, you know, but then, uh, when you talk about fear, people will know, okay, you know, fear can be useful in some cases where it actually helps you avoid danger. But at the same time, some of this fear can be quite irrational. So let me give you an example, right? Well, uh, cockroach is actually the one of the most feared kind of insects, right? But they're actually not the most dangerous insects at all, not even the top 10. But when you talk about mosquitoes, mosquito is actually one of the top 10 deadliest insects on earth. They are basically the pose a very real danger. But you have never ever seen anyone screaming over or running away from a, a, mo a mosquito, right? Basically, you see a mosquito immediately just smack or they use insecticide. But they don't run away. So they know there is a danger, but they're not fearful of it. So this gives you a comparison you know, between what is fear and what is a danger. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, since we are looking at the photo of cockroaches, is it true that cockroach can live on for seven days without their head? <laughs> okay, I don't know whether it just, this fact actually scares some of our audiences, but yeah, <laughs> it is true. The audience, uh, for your cockroach itself, they, once they are decapitated, right, they still can live on for up to seven days or even longer if the conditions are right. Okay, so why is this so? Uh, first thing is basically how they breathe. Right? Cockroaches, uh, unlike us humans, right, they don't breathe through our mouth or our nose. They actually have tiny holes along the side of their body, as you can see on the right-hand side of the picture. Right? This is actually how they breathe. So once you cut off the head, right, uh, the cockroaches do not, uh, are not deprived of oxygen. They still can breathe. 
at the same time, cockroaches also basically uh, or generally they actually have two brains. So when you cut off the main head, you're only cutting off the main brain. The secondary brain right, is along the uh, length of the body. Uh, is actually still functional and still carrying out the basic body function of like moving, you know, carrying out to make sure the pumping of the blood. So this is actually adds up to the reason why your cockroach can still live on up to seven days without the head. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing is that you know, uh, because you know, for us humans, so once you say decapitate us, right? There's we have blood pressure, so there will be a lot of profuse bleeding. Uh, for cockroaches or insects in general, they don't have that. So if you cut off the head, right? There's no profuse bleeding in the way that they will be to death. So that is why they can actually still live on for longer periods. So yeah, that is the fact about your cockroaches. <laughs> Wow, mm, that's fascinating and creepy at the same time. So despite the fear of insect, people and people get grossed out by some, we cannot deny that insects are extremely important and many of these insects, they are pollinators. And pollination is important as it leads to the production of fruits that we eat and also seeds that leads to more plants and many other benefits. So what else are insects useful for? Mm, okay, so uh, for insects and pollination, um, let me just tap on that for, for, for a moment. So when you talk about pollination, uh, it comes the insect that comes to mind will be basically your honeybees, right? Uh, but there are also other insects that pollinate, like your butterflies, right? Uh, and your moths. We will, will do pollination in the day, uh, night time, and then you also have flies that actually do pollination also. So the flies that you see on screen right now at the bottom, uh, half of the screen is a hoverfly. So these flies here they mimic your bees and moths. And then we also do have uh, maybe say you know, some of the beetles and wasps or so. So there are a whole lot of different kinds of pollinators, right? Uh, so to give an extent, you know, how important they are, right? Uh, I think for us, among all of us, right, the audience, right, I would say if all, if not most of us, we actually enjoy chocolate, right? So if anyone who's not enjoying chocolate, I guess this information may not be useful. But for those who are chocolate lovers, right? There's one group of insects that is actually a friend to us, and that is actually a group of flies uh, called the midges that you see on your screen right now. Why are they important? These guys are your pollinators of your cocoa plant. So without them, right, they can and not they cannot pollinate the flowers of your cocoa plant that is on the top right hand corner. Because they are actually very, very tiny. Because the opening for your for your uh, pollination, right, is actually around 3 mm in size. That's nice the size of your midges. Your honeybees uh, or your butterflies or beetles, right? They're too big. They cannot pollinate. So in case of like your climate change or your increased use of insecticide or pesticides, if this midges gets wiped out itself, uh, I would say you know it's time to say goodbye to our chocolate. So that shows you how important these midges are for your pollination of flowers. Okay. Uh, the other usefulness will be say maybe more in terms of biological control. So a good example would be your mud double warps, right? So uh, and usually these are tend to be quite uh, obvious, especially among urban farmers, right? Now what they tend to see is like say there's this little mud ball, uh, say stuck to the side of a flower pot or stuck to the side of a building or a corner of a house, right? And we see this. Uh, particular mud nest, they would think, oh, is that going to be a danger because uh, there might be a hive of uh, wasps? Uh, the answer is no, right? Usually for these wasps, if you don't provoke them, they are actually a friend to you. How is that so? Your mud double wasps, right, they will actually help you clear some of your pest caterpillars, right? And these pest caterpillars will actually eat up your vegetables on your urban farming. So they will actually bring back the caterpillars to the mud, uh, mud nest, put them inside, lay an egg, and then they seal it up, and then they will fly away. So your mud nest won't say grow into a hive, right? And you see these warps itself, you know, you just don't have to worry. Just uh, don't provoke them, let them be, and you're fine. And then they'll help you clear any possible pests that's uh, around your, your plants, right? Uh, the last one is uh, back to termites again, right? Um, termites is actually one of the most useful animals on Earth, right? Despite uh, that there's a few species of them that cause a lot of urban damage, and cause a lot of economical loss. Uh, why termites are important is because uh, there is a saying that ants and termites are the little rulers of the earth. So when it comes to your termite nest, right, they are actually like say uh, a stock of fertilizers. Right, your termites itself are always pooping every day. They are working twenty four seven hours. So you can imagine how there's a lot of poop 
and usually for termite colony, it can go from a hundred to thousands, even to up to a few million. That's uh, really a lot of poop, and then actually this poop can actually fertilize the ground and allow for your vegetation, like your trees, to grow on. At the same time, because your termites actually shine away from the sunlight, they actually tunnel through the ground. And as they tunnel through the ground, they actually create holes. And this makes the soil actually become porous. Right? Plants cannot grow on a compact soil. But a porous soil where the roots can grow through is actually very good. And because the, fertile, uh, the poop from your termites, they give a lot of fertilizers, your plants can grow. So that shows you how useful termites are, even though there are actually a few pests. Yeah, so that shows, uh, give me uh, an idea, you know, that insects in general, not all of them, uh, say, uh, pests or, say, uh, say, cause any damage to us humans, right? Most of them are actually tend to be quite useful, but it's just that we do not see them in action. Mm. So you can see that, like, insects are really very useful to us. And to add on to that, right, so one thing I'm very fascinated by is the Black Soldier Flies project that you're involved with. You know, every time we have leftover food in the office, then at pantry, you'll be like, hey, don't throw it away, give it to me. But it's actually not for you, it's for your flies. Yeah, correct. Yeah, this is... Uh... <laughs> so this project is conducted at the National University of Singapore, where the flies are bred to eat discarded food, right? In a bit to combat food waste. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yes, right. Um, so these black shoulder flies, right, they actually have been uh, been used by the farmers, but on a small scale to actually help convert food waste into fertilizers. Uh, and the larvae can be actually used as a uh, chicken feed or even fish feed itself. Right. Uh, this research project is still ongoing, right? Uh, but it's actually on a larger scale because, as you know, Singapore we do have a lot of food waste, and every year it's actually increasing in numbers. So what can we do to the food waste? Why not convert them to, let's like, say, our chicken feed and feed them to our chicken farm? Or actually create more fertilizers for our urban farmers as well. Right? And this will help to lower the cost. Right? So we are just basically picking up another knot and they are applying it to a larger scale. So when you see these flies around, right, they are actually harmless because the flies are actually not carrying any diseases at all. Yeah. And oh, the last thing about it, uh, I think maybe this might be more applicable to those who uh, say exercise a lot, like say the bodybuilders, right? Uh, you know, when eggs gets uh, to high prices, right, and they want to have another source of protein, why not use your soldier fly larvae as a source of protein? Yeah, that's something about food for thought. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so there's a video about this uh, Black Soldier Fly project. So let's just watch it. It's uh, quite a short video. Very impressive like what Mao Sheng has explained to us right the black soldier flies they help us in food recycling and yeah like what he said hmm, maybe if we need extra protein maybe the larvae can be used as human food but at first we need to get uh, overcome the fear of insects first before, before we can even think about that idea yeah. so remember a couple of months you even brought to the pantry a whole variety of insect snacks right in all sorts of flavors oh my god and then there were mega brownies, right? <laughs> and the brownies, yeah, it was not bad. It tasted a bit like cheese. <laughs> okay. So now that we're all working from home, right? Uh, I really miss going going out, going to the field. So now being in the research site, you go to the field much more. So I'm sure you miss it too. So recently, our one of our colleagues, Zaki, he showed me a video of when he went on a field expedition to Sarawak rainforest of Malaysian Borneo. It's 
a video of the team doing a night insect survey. So let me just play the video. Uh, I'm just going to warn everyone that the audio background's uh, a bit loud, so you might have to tune down the volume if you need it. Yeah, so let's just watch the video and Maoshan will later explain to us what's happening. video was a bit laggy. Yeah, uh, a bit laggy. It was quite uh, high quality and there's a lot of, uh, it needs a lot of bandwidth. Right, uh, so just to give you an idea what's happening, right? So what is uh, going on is that we actually have a light trap, right? Uh, in the middle of a very, very dark forest. And that is being the only light source or your insects will start swarming in. That's why you see there's a whole big swarm of insects. So we are, uh, what they are doing is uh, looking to like what is the diversity of insects present at the area itself, right? Basically, for those who are being attracted to the lights. So, uh, one, of my, one of our colleagues, right, is basically, like, you know, uh, taking some of the insects, right, to know, see, uh, and bring back for research. Yeah, so, you want to see what's the diversity out there, because you never know, maybe there might be a new species or something that's a new record. So, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, so this expedition was three weeks long and part of the Rimba Sarawak collaborative project between the museum and Sarawak Forestry Corporation. So if we go on to the next slide, yeah, so that's where that's uh, actually the museum team that went on that trip. And if you guys look at the bottom left hand corner, right, there's the Kampong Adida shoes that the locals swear by its durability. It's quite funny, right? Well, like when we go on fuel work, we tend to invest in the high quality branded gear, fuel gear, which of course is good. But when sometimes the locals, right, they just go for something very simple like this, or sometimes they even go barefoot and it seems to work just fine for them. Yeah. So these kinds of research projects are very important because it allows for information gathered from these efforts to be shared amongst various institutions. So after you get this information, right, you can use it to document biodiversity and even improve wildlife management. So being an educator, I take great pride in sharing to the members of the public about what our research colleagues do. Like recently, two species of flower flies were rediscovered in Singapore after 200 years, last seen by famous naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace. Our colleague helped with it, right, Mausha? Yes, correct. So our colleague, Dr. Oh, Dr. Uh, uh, he actually helped to rediscover uh, one of the two species, uh, the uh, flower flies, right? Uh, this one was the, one of the most recent discovery was actually in the survey at Bogi Kima Nature Reserve, right? Uh, and you know, there are actually fewer than 10 of these individuals uh, to be found worldwide. It shows you how rare the flower fly is, right? Um, and as you can see from the photo, right, there are four different insects, right? All of them are looking similar. So for us, among us audience here, do you make a guess on which one is actually the flower fly? Right? The flower fly is actually the second one from the left. You see how similar it is to the fauna. So it basically, it just helps to uh, helps it to make sure that oh, it doesn't get eaten by like your birds when you see a like hornet looking fly. Yeah, and then uh yeah, like as mentioned, uh your not only your bees are helpful in pollination, your flower flies, your hover flies, they are also useful in pollination too. Okay, uh, the next one is, uh, yes, and then, yes, uh, the other one, we have a new species of trap jaw ant that is found in our Singapore mangroves, uh, on total markers, uh, literal list. Uh, this was uh, discovered by uh, one of our curators, Dr. Wenyi Wang, together with some collaboration with our Japanese researchers, right? Uh, so, 
it's quite mm, uh, interesting to know that we actually still have new species that can be found in Singapore. And what's so interesting about your trap jaw and why right, they can actually uh, open up their jaws almost 180 degrees and then when they snap shut like right, they produce a lot of force you know and this is very useful in capturing their prey yeah so these are actually the two of the interesting things that we found uh, quite recently yeah it's quite amazing that ants are able to cope with this because the intertidal area is such a challenging environment with the constantly changing tide so this remains for future research Okay, so Mao, so since we have talked about um, the research work and your field work, I was wondering what is your favorite part of your job? Is it field work, lab work, or creation? Uh, okay, I guess the first one would be field work because I always like to enjoy going out there and trying to find like, are there any new species or any new records to So it's going out there, it's always like an adventure. Right? Uh, but at the same time, I also kind of enjoy uh, to be inside the museum because the museum itself right is like a treasure trove right there's a lot of insects that have been collected by different researchers students uh, from the past and they're sitting in the museum right now and then it's like you're opening up a box and then finding different kind of treasures because you never know that when you I search through uh, insect park there might be actually a new species right inside there right so it's always that uh, little bit of like potential discovery of a new species or new record that keeps it uh, so Maushal, thank you for talking to us today for such uh for such a long time. <laughs> I'm not like this, but now we have about 200 people listening to us, so it's quite different. Mm -hmm. We hope that everyone's enjoyed themselves and maybe learned something uh, new as well. The next session is gonna happen next Thursday, 21st of May, same time. So 2 30 to 3 15, maybe we'll slightly overrun again. Okay. <laughs> speaker for that session is someone we also work with but she isn't museum staff she's also an educator i'm just going to leave it there and not reveal anything else uh, because to find out more please keep a look out on our museum's social media posts the post and link to the next session will be ready by tonight and registration will be via an eventbrite link again so please register fast uh, spread the word to your friends who may be interested and hope to see you guys next thursday